come now to what I think is probably the highlight of the day, the Tabernacle of David. An absolutely glorious subject, this one, brothers and sisters, but straight away we're going to put the bar quite high. I want you to come to Acts chapter 7 and have a look at the revelation by Stephen in his address to the Sanhedrin of David's mission. And this is how he brings his discourse on this day to an end. In verse 44, he says this. Acts 7, verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. So he's talking about the tabernacle of Moses. And we'll be looking at that tabernacle very briefly uh, as we pass it by a little later on in our considerations here this afternoon. Just like David passed it by as he took the ark to Zion. It was as though he waved to the priests who were burning sacrifices at the tabernacle of Moses. It was Gibeon, 10 kilometres north of Jerusalem. He comes from Kerjath Jerim. He probably passes within a few kilometres. He waves to the priests and says, you're doing a great job, boys. Keep it up. Any problem is I'm taking the ark and putting it in a tent of my own in Jerusalem. It's not going back to where you think it belongs. You think it belongs in the most holy place. David says, no, it doesn't belong there. So this straight away, see, brings us to a slightly higher level, doesn't it? And that's where Stephen's mind was. I want to show you in Acts chapter 7. He says this in verse 45 of this tabernacle, the tabernacle of Moses, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Joshua, as it should read, into the possession of the Gentiles. Hmm, Gentiles. Whom God drove out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. So the tabernacle of Moses was brought into the possession of the Gentiles by Joshua, And the Gentiles were driven out by God for 500 years unto the days of David. So what changed in the days of David? Well, something very significant changed, brothers and sisters. David converted the Gentiles instead of killing them. That's what he did. He converted the Gentiles. We're going to see he had literally tens of thousands of Gentiles in his kingdom and most of them were Philistines and they were not circumcised Philistines. They were uncircumcised Philistines. So I'm laying a few things on you straight away which will unravel as we go on. So here David doesn't kill Gentiles, he converts them. What we read next? Verse 46. Who found favour before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Well, there's already a tabernacle. This is the tabernacle of Moses. Why build a new one? Well, he needed a new one because David was going to incorporate Gentiles into the Abrahamic promises and he wasn't going to ask them to be circumcised (coughs) you know what Paul says in Romans 4 about (coughs) Abraham that God counted him righteous he asked the question when God counted Abraham righteous (coughs) in Genesis 15 was he circumcised then? no he was circumcised in Genesis 17 that was 14 years later So you see, this is what David understood. We're going to see that. We're going to see why he found favour with God. Who found favour before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Now I'm not going to read the next couple of verses just now. Just cast your eyes at verse 47 and 48 of Acts 7. We're going to come back to those, God willing, a little later in our session. We're going to see why Stephen says what he does. But Solomon built him a house. How be it the most high? Dwelleth not in temples made with hands. We'll come back to those words in due course. So why did did David find favour with God? Well, because of the tabernacle of David. 
So come along to Acts chapter 15, where this phrase is again encountered. Now we know what Acts 15 is about, don't we? It's around AD 49 or thereabouts in that area. And the Jerusalem conference is held because the brotherhood (coughs) is being shaken by a big issue. There are big issues here. And the issue is those who are saying in verse 1 that the Gentiles should be circumcised. See this, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. This is a life and death matter. This class of Christadelphians are saying, unless you're circumcised, you won't be in the kingdom. Paul and Peter and James are going to say something different, as we know. So there's a big conference held, and all the brethren of importance and standing turn up in Jerusalem. And for days, they debate the issues. Paul stands up. We read that, of course, uh, in, uh, in the verses 6 onwards. We read, And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider this matter. It's around AD 50-ish, 51 thereabouts. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren. And he, he recounts the story of his visit to the house of Cornelius. So you've got Paul standing up, Verse 2, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension with them. Peter stands up. And when you get to verse 11, they're still debating the issue. It hasn't been resolved. The input of Paul and Peter has not resolved the issue. So who stands up then? James. Verse 12. The multitude kept silence and gave audience when Barnabas and Paul declared what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. No resolution. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, Peter he means, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, he means in the house of Cornelius, to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets. As it is written, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the Amos, the age. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. It's all over. It's all over. The debate comes to an end. They take out the pens and they write the decrees. No more arguing. And all he's done is quoted Amos chapter 9. And you will have noticed by now that the term Gentiles occurs seven times in this context of Acts chapter 15. Again, it's entirely accidental. Seven, the number of the Abrahamic covenant. Seven times this term, Gentiles. And James' astonishing citation of Amos 9, verses 11 to 15, which of course is actually based on the context of the kingdom, brings an end to all debate. An end to all debate. And we're going to see why in a moment, brothers and sisters, there was an end to all debate. It's because of the reference to the tabernacle of David. That's why. <coughs> now, why? Well, you see, there's, there's actually two passages quoted here by James. The words after this, I will return, are taken from Jeremiah 12, verse 15. You can check that one out in your own time. But the other one is from Amos chapter 9. So let's come back to Amos 9 and have a look at what James quotes. quotes verses 11 and 12. You'll notice that verses 13 to 15 are actually about the kingdom age. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that the ploughman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that sows seed, etc. But James is not quoting this passage in the context of the kingdom age. 
That's where it leads. And the issue in Acts 15 is a life and death matter. If you're not circumcised, say the Judaistic class in the Ecclesia, you can't be saved. So he quotes these words, verse 11. <coughs> in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Eden. I just want you to take that name on board. We're going to meet that in a moment. The remnant of Eden and of all the nations which are called by my name, saith Yahweh, that doeth this. So he's quoted those two verses. Now what's the context of these verses, brothers and sisters? Well, quite apart from this matter of the tabernacle of David, have a look at verse 7 of Amos 9. He has gone up braiding his people for their unfaithfulness. And this is what he says to them in verse 7. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Now by Ethiopians here, he doesn't mean the ones who live in Ethiopia. All right? This is the Hebrew word kush. Cushites. And the Cush he's referring to is the Cush of Nimrod. Okay? Nimrod and Semiramis. That's the Cush. It's the one of Genesis chapter 2. The original Cush. There were three Cushes in the Bible, by the way. And the reference here is to the one in Genesis chapter 2. The home of the Babylonian apostasy. So he says to his people, Are ye not as the children of the Cushites unto me? Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt? Yes. And the Philistines from Kaftor, Crete? Yes. And the Syrians from Kerr? Yes. What's he saying to them, brothers and sisters? At the same time that Yahweh called Israel out of Egypt, you know what he was also doing? He was taking the Philistines from Crete and depositing them on their southern coast. At the same time that he was doing that, he was taking the Syrians from Kerr and depositing them on their northeastern border. The next door neighbours of his people Israel were going to be the Philistines in the south and the Syrians in the north. You know what God's saying to these people? To Israel, his people? He's saying, now listen, I fulfilled my covenant to Abraham but I spoke to him in Genesis 15 that I would deliver you out of Egypt and I have done that. At the same time, I brought the Philistines, the uncircumcised Philistines, and put them on your coast. And I brought the Syrians from Kerr and put them on your northern border. Don't you think that I could have done with them what I have done with you? See the point he's making? It's only because of the Abrahamic covenant that he's doing what he's doing in Israel. At the same time, God is working with uncircumcised peoples. Guess what? In the days of David, 500 years later, in Israel, there are literally tens of thousands of uncircumcised Philistines. So what's David going to do? Could you go to the tabernacle of Moses and worship Yahweh without being circumcised? No. So what's he going to do? He's going to put the Ark of the Covenant in a tent of his own making, quite separate from the Mosaic, so that Philistines can gather with the Jews, with Israel, and worship Yahweh without the hindrance of the law which required their circumcision. That's what he's going to do. And everyone in Acts 15 knew that. They knew their history. At least when they were reminded of it, they remembered their history. And so the argument was over. It was all over. The tabernacle of David ends all debate about uncircumcised Gentiles. Because the Philistines had been converted by David and not asked to be circumcised. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the age, says James. Debate over. Get out the pens, let's write the decrees. Isn't that interesting? It's all because of this tabernacle of David. So we need to explore why. What was it all about? Well, you see, before we do that, let's just remind ourselves of where we're heading, brothers and sisters, very soon. 
to be kings and priests to operate in this house. And in Isaiah chapter 16 verse 5 we read this about the house of prayer for all nations. And in mercy shall the throne be established and he shall sit upon it. That's the throne of David. In, in truth, where? Where's Christ going to sit? In the temple of Ezekiel's prophecy? Yes. Not called that here, is it? Is it called the house of prayer for all nations here, like Isaiah 56 verse 7 says? No. What's it called? The tabernacle of David. That's what that's called. It's exactly where David pitched his tent. Alright? The tabernacle of David. And Christ will sit there judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. Why? Because it's a house of prayer for all nations. See? That's the point of that. I did warn you I'm going to raise the bar. Come on. Be fair. But it won't get easier. Because we're going to go back and explore the roots of this tabernacle of David. So let's come back and have a look. Second Chronicles chapter 1. <coughs> Now for those of you who have heard this before, this is a, a walk in the park, as they say. For those of you hearing it for the first time, you're going to have to put your brain in gear. Okay? But we will go through this step by step. Here in the second of Chronicles chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, we read this. So Solomon and all the congregation with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon. Now this is, as I said, 10 kilometres north of Jerusalem. For there was the tabernacle of the congregation of God, which Moses, the servant of Yahweh, had made in the wilderness. But, notice this, verse 4, but the ark of God had David brought up from kerchath Jerem to the place which David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it at Jerusalem. So here is the tabernacle of David quite separate to the tabernacle of Moses. Ten kilometres away to the north. Tabernacle of Moses. This one is pitched in Zion. Have a look at 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 1. First Chronicles 15 verse 1 we read this. And David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. Then read on. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. Verse 3. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of Yahweh unto his place, which he had prepared for it. Turn the page to chapter 16, verse 1. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the, in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered sacrifices and peace offerings before God. So I think by now we can see that the tabernacle of David is an entirely separate instrument. Entirely separate tabernacle or tent to the one that Moses made in the wilderness. <coughs> Okay, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Why? Well, there are reasons. Now come back and have a look at the bringing up of the ark to Zion in 2 Samuel chapter 6. This is a pretty well-known passage of scripture, isn't it? We'll just see if we can explore a few things here. 2 Samuel chapter 6. I don't need to go into all this story, do I? You know that Uzzah died when they were bringing the ark on a cart, which was a Philistine method, okay? And it shook, and he put out his hand, this man, Gone. Dead. Killed on the spot. David is very unhappy with this. He, he's fearful of Yahweh this day. He, he doesn't know whether he's got this right, you see. So we read, verse 9, that David was afraid of Yahweh that day and he said, How shall, I, how shall the ark of Yahweh come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, 
But he carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, the, the Gittite means, of course, that he lived in a city which had Gath in its name. And the city he lived in was gath Rimon, not the Gath of Goliath. This is gath Rimon. This Obed-Edom was a Kohathite. Now, it was the Kohathites who used to have to carry the ark, right? Now, David had got this wrong. He'd put it on a Philistine cart, so to speak, using a Philistine method. And said, God said, now listen, you got this wrong, David. And David thought, well, maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe I shouldn't be bringing the ark to Zion. So I'm going to test God. I'm going to put a test on this. So he looks around. First thing, we've got to have Kohathites involved. Second thing, I'm going to look for a Kohathite with a very unusual name. Now what Israelite would call their son Obed-Edom? Obed means servant. The servant of Edom. Now come on. This would be like Christadelphian parents calling their son the servant of Benedict. You know, Benedict the 16th. Would you call... Because you see, Eden in the Bible speaks of Babylon the Great. That's what it represents in the scripture. Babylon the Great. Now, nobody in their right mind would call their son the servant of the Pope. Would you? No. So David looks around and says, hmm, he's got the right name. <laughs> He's the servant of Edom. <coughs> now, did you recall what Amos 9 verse 11 said, 11 and 12? That the remnant of Edom and of all the nations. Remember that? Mm -hmm. There's a link there. Okay. <coughs> so he picks this house and he goes back to Jerusalem, sits in his palace and waits for news. And the news comes. Let's read on. Verse 11. And the ark of Yahweh continued in the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite, three months. And Yahweh blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now, people talk about how that blessing came about, whether it was additional members of the family over you know, these wife fell pregnant. We don't know, and it doesn't matter. What we do know is it was palpably obvious to everyone that the divine blessing was in the house of Obed-Edom. And someone comes along and says to David, you know what? God has blessed the house of Obed-Edom. He says, you beauty. I know I was right. I haven't got this wrong. God's intervened to show me I haven't got it wrong. Oh yes, I messed it up. In the method of the transport, I acknowledge that. But my intention to take the ark to Zion and to bypass the tabernacle of Moses is right. That's why Stephen says in Acts 7, he found favour with God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. And what says Jacob in Acts 7? Yeah, you've got to think about it. Jacob is the natural name, isn't it? And I'll tell you something. You follow that name through, it's always going to be used in relation to the Gentiles as well as to 12 prophets of Israel. You know why? Because of Deuteronomy 32 verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, he divided them according to the number of the children of Israel. Yeah. Jacob has 12 sons. But is that the number of the nations that God divided in Genesis 10 and 11? No. 70. And when Jacob came into Egypt, he had 70 sons. Sons and grandsons. Start with 12, Israel. And then to the Gentile, the 70. So that's why Jacob is used in Acts chapter 7. It is absolutely pristine the way that God presents these maps. But you don't have to sit there and say, oh, I don't know. You can see it. You see the spirit beaming out at you. And that's the way it should be, brothers and sisters. We've got arguments about doctrine. Don't put your opinion on it. I don't want to hear your opinion. I only want to hear God's testimony. That's what I want to hear. Let the Bible do its own interpreting, because it does. 
So what's, let's do a bit of that, shall we? He's got the ark. He knows it's in the house of Obed-Edom and it's been blessed. Verse 12, was told King David saying, Yahweh has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertains unto him because, notice this, because of the ark of God. So David went and he brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they had they, they that bear the ark, this is the Carathites now, had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fattened. Now we don't know that he did this for every six pa uh, paces. But I, I think for a goodly part of this journey they did that. That the Carathites would take six paces. Now that's not that far, is it? Six steps. Stop! And on the seventh they offered sacrifices. First Chronicles 15 verse 26 tells you seven animals of each variety. So what's David telling God? He's saying to him, I understand, my God, that we are in the dispensation of the law of Moses. But what I am doing is not about being under the law of Moses. What I'm doing is about Melchizedek, the Melchizedek order. Now we'll come to that in a moment. And so he acknowledges by the six steps that it's going to take 6,000 years before this can become a reality. But he understands the principles involved. And the principle involved is the inclusion of Gentiles. Now that is how this unfolds, as we shall see. And David danced, verse 14. And he was girded with a linen ephod. Linen ephod? Priests wore that. So he's a king. And he's a priest. After the order of Melchizedek. How do we know that? Well, we read that verse 16, as the ark of Yahweh came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and she saw King David leaping and dancing and she despised him in her heart. Who does she represent, do you think? The Mosaic system. That's why at the end of the chapter she's barren. And law doesn't save anybody. So Michael, the daughter of Saul, is barren. Law doesn't get anybody into the kingdom. David's operating as a Melchizedek king priest. He's dressed not as a king, but as a priest. And what does he do as a priest? Well, he offers offerings. But read verse 17. Verse 17. Verse 17, and they brought in the ark of Yahweh and set it in his place in the midst of the tent. This is the word Ohel. Guess what the word was in Isaiah 16, verse 5, brothers and sisters? That Christ will sit in the tabernacle of David. You got it? Ohel, tent. In the tent of David. Here it is. <coughs> that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Who's offering these? David. He's a priest. As soon as David had made an end of the burnt offering, he blessed the people. Blessed the people? Who did that? When Abraham came back with all the spoils of war in Genesis 40, who blessed him? <clears throat> Melchizedek. So he's occupying the position of a king priest. What does he do next? Well, let's read on. Verse 19. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as to the women as the men. Women and men? Equally together? Yes. Tomorrow morning we will come for the memorial meeting. And the stewards will go around distributing bread and wine, won't they? Do you think that they're going to come past the sister and say, no, 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 no. Here, give it to the brother? Or will the men and the women share equally? Equally. Of course they will. And that's what David does. And guess who else is here? that's receiving what he's going to give them, Philistines. We're going to see in a moment, many of them, many Gentiles. And we read in verse 19 that he gave as well as to the women and as the men, to everyone. Oh, now that's significant language, isn't it? To everyone. A cake of bread and a flagon of wine. He gave them what Melchizedek gave Abraham and his Jewish and Gentile company. Bread and wine, the tokens of the sacrifice of Christ. Got it? 
Now you know why we found favour with God. We desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Now you know why the debate ended in Acts 15 when James quotes Amos 9. It's all over. After this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David that has fallen down. Why was it fallen down? Well, the next verse in Acts 7 says, But Solomon built him a house, and they took the ark out of David's tent and put it in the temple. And the tabernacle of David was fallen down. They went back under the law. That's what they did. So this is a marvellous theme, isn't it? This is the understanding of David. What a perception this man had of the purpose of God. Would God that we could come up to that level, brothers and sisters. So why does he do all this? I want you to have a look at 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel 15, he's fleeing from Absalom. <coughs> and we read this in verse 18. And all his servants passed on beside him, and all the Kerithites and all the Pelethites. Who are they? Well, you can jot down Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 5. It will tell you very plainly who they are. They're Philistines, or Philistines, as I think you say, on this continent. They're Philistines. That's who they are. The Kerithites and the Pelethites, and all the Gittites. Now, where are these Gittites from? Well, this is not the Gath ribbon of Obed-Eden. Read on. 600 men which came after him from Gath. That's the hometown of Goliath. They passed on before the king. Then sent the king to Itai. Itai means near. The Gittite. So this is one of the 600 who's come from the hometown of Gath. Of Goliath in Gath. And he says to this man, Wherefore goest thou also with us? Return to thy place and abide with the king, that is, with Absalom. For thou art a stranger. So he's a Gentile. And an exile. An exile from what? Well, he's left his Philistine origins behind. He left his Philistine religions behind. And he's coming to Israel. He's espoused the hope of Israel, this man. How can I be so definite? Just read on. Verse 20. Whereas thou camest, but yesterday, should I this day make thee go up and down with us, seeing I go whither I may? Return thou, and, and take back thy brethren, the six hundred of you from Gad. Mercy and truth be with thee. There's the divine character, by the way, at the end of verse 20. And Atai answered the king and said, As Yahweh liveth. He doesn't say as the Philistine God lives. You know, the one that fell over? Dagon. He doesn't say as Dagon lives. He says, As Yahweh liveth, and as my lord the king liveth, surely in what place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also will thy servant be. It seems a bit like Ruth's <coughs> declaration to Naomi, to me. I don't know. Here is a Christadelphian. And you reckon he was circumcised? No. This is why David built his tabernacle. <coughs> so that Philistines could come into the truth and not have to be circumcised. That's why. Otherwise they would have been excluded by the tabernacle of Moses. And as you read in this context, it's palpably obvious, isn't it? You go to chapter 18, you find that fully one third of David's army against Absalom's army were Philistines. And he puts this man in charge of them. It tay the Giddah. So one third of his army is Philistines. And they're on his side against Absalom. So they are loyal. They're very loyal to David. Why? Because he's desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Now that's the story of the tabernacle of David, brothers and sisters. We could sit down now, but I'm not going to. Uh, and you'd probably have enough, wouldn't you? Well, there's more. We want to see the end of the story. And that's why we read 1 Chronicles 21. So let's go and have a look at 1 Chronicles 21. Let's 
The numbering of Israel, mistake or otherwise. Now we've heard, you know, several views about this in recent times as to whether or not David really made a mistake. You know, and this is the passage that's quoted. It's a summary of David's life because David did that which was right in the eyes of Yahweh and turned not aside from the thing that he commanded. Save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So it's suggested, well, that's the only sin, the only major sin of David's life. This matter of Bathsheba and Uriah. By this deed, we read, thou hast given occasion for the enemies of Yahweh to blaspheme. That's the reason why I believe it's the only one referred to there. Because this sin with Bathsheba brought dishonour on the name of the God of Israel. The things that happened in 1 Chronicles 21 didn't get spread around the nations. They happened internally. That's why I believe there's only one thing here. So who sinned, David or Israel? So look at the testimonies. 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1, which is in front of us, says that Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number them. So Israel's in the firing line here. 2 Samuel 24 verse 1 says, And again the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. So doubtless, Israel was deserving of punishment at this time. They'd become lax, complacent, or whatever else. And God was going to give them a shake and wake them up. And that happened through the incident of the numbering of Israel and its consequences. But was David free of error in numbering his people? We read in 1 Chronicles 27, verses 23 and 24, and I'm doing this because if I was to take you to each of these passages, we wouldn't get through it. But David took not the number of them from 20 years old and under, because Yahweh had said he would increase Israel like to the stars of the heavens. And Joab, who he sent out to number Israel, the son of Zeruiah, began to number, but he finished not, because there fell wrath for it against Israel. Israel. Neither was the number put in the account of the chronicles of King David. It's been suggested that in fact this wasn't a sin of David the real problem was Israel and that what David was doing in numbering Israel was to take in the half shekel of the sanctuary so that he could use this for the building of the temple, the preparation of the temple. I don't believe so brothers and sisters I believe David messed this up good and proper. And we're going to see why God took such savage vengeance upon his people. And David understood that he was the one at the heart of this problem. <coughs> in 1 Chronicles 21 verse 7, 17 we read, And David said to God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? So that's the cause of the problem, isn't it? Even I that have sinned and done evil indeed, but as for these sheep, what have they done? 2 Samuel 24 verse 10 David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. But David said unto Yahweh I have sinned greatly in that I have done and now I beseech thee O Yahweh take away the iniquity of thy servant for I have done very foolishly. So you think David sinned? You know, James chapter 4 verse 17 says to him that knoweth to do right and doeth it not, to him it is sin. In Romans, Paul says something similar, doesn't he? Was it in Timothy? He says that if you don't act by faith, it's sin. David wasn't acting out of faith here. He wasn't acting out of a good purpose. And he made a very serious mistake. Because when he said to Joab and his men to go out and to number, they were to number the children of Israel. So who gets left out? Number the tribes of Israel. Who's left out? The tens of thousands of Gentiles who live in the land. Now when you numbered Israel, just to know their number, that was forbidden. You couldn't do that. You could not go out and count up the men you had so that you could say, oh, look, I've got two million. <laughs> God didn't want you to know the number. He wanted you to trust him no matter if you had ten or ten million. He wanted you to trust him. But if you numbered Israel, the half shekel was required to impress the need for redemption. Whether you were rich or poor, you paid the half shekel. Silver is the symbol for redemption. Rich or poor, pay half. Why? Because you all need redemption. So you're acknowledging your divine need. 
The need for God to redeem you. Okay? You can number them for that reason. Not just to see how many people you had in your army. But numbering the tribes of Israel and omitting the Gentiles in the land was David's greatest mistake. And God makes him pay, as we're going to see. Hence, when you read this record of 1 Chronicles 21, we come to verse 14. He's been given three choices, hasn't he? The three choices are in verse 12. He chooses the three days of pestilence. Knowing that God is merciful, he says, I'll take the three days. So verse 14 says that Yahweh sent pestilence upon Israel and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. Why that number do you think? Well you see 70 is the number of the Gentiles. You can prove that from Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 and by adding up the names in Genesis chapter 10. It's an exercise for our younger brethren. If you haven't done that, work through Genesis chapter 10. And you'll find there are 70 families there. This is the number of the nations. You can prove that from a number of actual places in the scripture. And a thousand to a Hebrew represents a family. That's why Gideon said to the angel in Judges 6 verse 15, My thousand, it's family in the AV, but it's not the word for family. It's the word for thousand. My thousand. By a thousand, of course, it's meant you start with one, a father, and he multiplies, and you get a thousand. So a thousand to a Hebrew met a family. So God says, David, you left the Gentiles out. You did not count them. You've changed course, David. You've gone back on your understanding of, of the involvement of Gentiles in my purpose. You sent Joab out to number the children of Israel. You're going to belong to a tribe to be numbered. What about the Gentiles, David? So I will take out of your people 70,000. The family of the Gentiles in equivalent. So he takes out 70,000 Jews. You leave them out? This is what I do to you. Got the message? Now does David understand this? Does he know that this is what God's doing? Well let's pursue this, shall we? Because... He comes to Ornan's threshing floor. So let's just read down. Verse 15. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And this was, as he was destroying, Yahweh beheld. That word beheld happens to be the Hebrew word re'ah. We'll come back to that in a moment. And he repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed it, It's enough. Stay now thine hand. That's the same phrase that you find in Genesis 22 verse 12. When God said to Abraham, he's got a knife above Isaac he's about to stab Isaac stay on him it's all part of the story brothers and sisters as we're going to see in a moment it's all coming back coming from the experience of Abraham verse 16 oh sorry let's just finish off verse 15 and the angel of Yahweh stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite oh he's a Gentile Yes. Seriously, he's a Gentile. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of Yahweh stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel were clothed in sackcloth and fell upon their faces. And David said, Oh, I'm the one that sinned. Got a picture of the story? And the angel stops his judgment <coughs> at the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Now Ornan signifies strong according to Strong's concordance or life was perpetuated according to Brown Driver Briggs. The name occurs 12 times in the scripture and 12 is the number of Israel. Again it's entirely accidental brothers and sisters that these things happen. 11 of those 12 are in 1 Chronicles 21. He has another name in, in the record of Samuel. His name, Arona, signifies the joyful shouting of Yah. That name occurs nine times in 2 Samuel 24. And he's a Jebusite, which means trodden down. 
That's a threshing floor. That's why it's trodden down. And where is this? Well, it's in the threshing floor of all of the Jebus. Where did you build threshing floors? In the valley? No, on a hill. Why? Because once you've threshed, you want a winnow. You want to throw the stuff up in the air so that the wind will blow the chaff away and the wheat will drop down, right? So it's on the top of the hill. What hill? We're going to find out that that hill happens to be Moriah. It's the hill of Moriah where Abraham took Isaac and offered him up. Okay? So you can see we're starting to build from where this is coming from. Now Ornan has four sons. Four, the number of a new creation, the number of righteousness. So here's a new creation being developed in righteousness. Now if you take Ornan, he's one, number one. He's got four sons. How many other? In the family? Five. The number of divine grace. And divine judgment stops at the threshing floor of a faithful Gentile family. What a marvellous story that is, eh? And this is not very far away from a tent. The tabernacle of David. Okay? And David has for the time forgotten why he put it there. And he's ordered the numbering of Israel leaving the Gentiles out and God says, right, I'm going to teach you something you already know. So he's taught what he already knew. And he's commanded to build an altar in Ornan's threshing floor in Mount Moriah. Now, just keep your hand in 1 Chronicles 21 and come back to, to come to 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. In fact, I didn't even need to get you to do that because I've got it on the screen. Anyway, if you're there, this is what you're going to find in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where Yahweh appeared unto David, his father, in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So where's the threshing floor of Ornan? Well, it's on Mount Moriah, isn't it? The very place where Abraham took Isaac. So that's just simple proof of where this all took place. Now, coming back to 1 Chronicles 21, let's just see what David tried to do here in the, in the drama of this day. Come to verse 28 of 1 Chronicles 21. And that time when David saw that Yahweh had answered him in the threshing floor of all in the Jebusite, then he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of Yahweh which Moses made in the wilderness and the altar of burnt offering were at that season in the high place at Gibeon, 10 kilometres north. But David could not go before it to inquire of God. For he was afraid because of the sword of the angel of Yahweh. David was utterly confused, brothers and sisters. Utterly confused. He ordered the numbering of Israel. His heart smote him. And then God says, I'll give you three choices. He chooses the three days. There's 70,000 of his people being slaughtered. I mean, just imagine being responsible for the death of 70,000 people. And, and he's saying, what am I going to do? You know what he's going to do? He's going to run to Gibeon. That's what he's going to do. I'll run to, the, to Gibeon. I'll go to the tabernacle of Moses. And God stops him. <laughs> he stops him. Why? Well, because... As David's making his way north, the angel arrives with a sword drawn in his hand. You're not going anywhere, David. Just stay right there. Where is he? In the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And God says to him, now listen, you make an altar here and offer sacrifices and I'll accept. I don't want you to go into the tabernacle of Gibeon. You had this right once and you've forgotten That's what he's telling you. He tried to go there, but God stopped him. Now David knew, didn't he, where Christ would be sacrificed, brothers and sisters. In 1 Samuel 17, 54, he comes into Saul with the head of Goliath in his hand. You know, this ugly looking brute of a man, <coughs> bristling hair, dripping blood. He comes in, he says, have a look at this. 
It's the head of Goliath. You know what he does? Puts his armour in his tent. He takes a 20 kilometre journey to Jebus. This is not in the hands of the Jews. He goes to Jebus. And he puts that head in a place that I believe later became known as Golgotha, the skull of Goliath. Why did he do that, do you think? Why did this 17 or 18 year old boy go from the Valley of Elah to Jerusalem with the head of Goliath? Well, he wrote Psalm 8 at the same time. And Psalm 8 is about the work of Christ. Exercising dominion over carnal things. David knew exactly where Christ would be sacrificed. He knew exactly where he would be sacrificed. How did he know that? Well, from Genesis 22. By looking at the story of Abraham and Isaac and seeing in them Yahweh and Christ. And where did God say to take Isaac? Well, to Moriah. See? So when God says to him, you make an altar here. Don't you foolishly go back to Gibeon. You make an altar here in Mount Moriah. David knows. And this is where Christ is going to be sacrificed. And why would Christ be sacrificed? To save just Jews? No. Nah. To save Jew and Gentile. Whom he's left out. In the numbering of Israel. So David sacrifices on Moriah. We read in verse 28. And then what does he do? You know, this is one of those little imprimatas. You could say to me, well, that's just your opinion. Brother Jim, that's just your opinion. And then I'll point to the first two verses of the next chapter. Then David said, This is the house of Yahweh Elohim. And this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. Where? In the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Now read the next verse. And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel, and he sent masons to hew wrought stones to build the house of God. The very first thing he does is send messengers out, and so I want all the Gentiles to come. I want all the Gentiles to come. Got it? He knows. He knows the mistake he's made. He left the Gentiles out of the numbering. Reckon that's where the story ends? No, it doesn't, brothers and sisters. This is what 2 Chronicles 3 verse 1 says. Remember, we were back at this passage a while ago. Solomon began to build the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where Yahweh appeared. This word Moriah means seen of Yah. And when it says where Yahweh appeared unto David his father, the margin is correct. It says, which was seen of David his father. Now what's this all about? Well, let me just give you in a nutshell what Genesis 22 is all about. Take thy son, thine only one, whom thou lovest, to Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt sacrifice unto me. Moriah, seen of Yah. So when Abraham takes Isaac, God's looking down from heaven. He's looking at himself in the person of Abraham as a type. He's looking at his son in the person of Isaac, type of Christ. And he's watching them. And they come from Beersheba. Beersheba? And they come to Moriah. Guess where David got Joab to start his numbering of Israel, brothers and sisters? Beersheba. That's what it says in 1 Chronicles 21. And verse 2. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people... Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan. How often do you read it that way around? Very infrequently. It's usually from Dan to Beersheba, isn't it? But this is from Beersheba to Dan. Dan means judgment. They went from the well of the seven, which is what Beersheba means, the well of the covenant, we're going to talk about that briefly in a moment, to judgment. Got an idea? Okay, so when God says to Abram, you take your son whom you love and you go to Moriah, I'm going to watch you because this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the same place with my son. You know what Abraham calls this place in the wake of the sacrifice of Isaac and the ram? He calls it 
Yahweh Yira. You know what that word is? It's the same two Hebrew words that form the name Moriah. Moriah means seen of Yah. Raya, Yah. Yahweh Yira is the other way around. Same two Hebrew words. Just switched around. So whereas Moriah means to be seen of Yah, Yahweh Yira means, and this is the explanation given you in, in Genesis 22, in this mount, Mount Moriah, Yahweh will be seen. He'll be seen there with his son. Got it? That's why the name switched around. Brothers and sisters, this, this is really stretching our minds a bit, isn't it? This is raising the bar a bit further, but it is pristine in its beauty. So David is reminded of Genesis 21 and 22. What happened in Genesis 21? Let's come back to Genesis 21. Let's just briefly remind ourselves of what happened here in Genesis 21. Genesis 21, verses 22 to 34, we read of very important incidents in the life of Abraham. Ishmael and Hagar are finally banished. We know what that represents, brothers and sisters. It's the setting aside of the Mosaic order. That's what that represents. Hagar, law of Moses. Ishmael, Jews living under law, circumcised in flesh but not in heart, put out of Abraham's house. What comes next? Well, Abraham makes a covenant with Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. And Abraham offers up Isaac in the next chapter as a type of God and Christ in the act of sacrifice. And God makes the covenant unconditional. In thy seed shall all nations be blessed. And then what does Abraham receive? At the end of Genesis 22, he receives news of his family in the Gentile lands. And guess how many sons there are born to Milcar? Twelve. The Israel of God in Gentile lands. What happens next? Genesis 23. Sarah dies. Who does she represent? Zion. Put aside for a time. What happens in Genesis 24? Abraham sends his servant to preach the gospel in Gentile lands. To find a bride for his son, Isaac. Christ. And in they come from the Gentile lands. Got a picture? That's the broad brush of Genesis 21, 22, 23, and 24. And you and I are involved in that. Amongst the last to come in to be part of the bride of Christ. And that's why you can lay Genesis 22 over against 1 Chronicles 21 and you can see all these comparisons. Verse 1. Abraham is tested, Genesis 22. 1 Chronicles 21, David is tested. They go from Beersheba to Abraham and Isaac to go to Moriah. David numbers from Beersheba to Dan. In verse 4 of Genesis 22, there are three days to Moriah. 1 Chronicles 21, verses 12 to 15, there are three days to Moriah. The pestilence starts. Where does it end? In three days? Moriah. In verse 12, Abraham's hand is stayed. Stay thine home! Chronicles 21, verse 15. Yahweh says to the angels, got a drawn sword. Stay now thine hand. In verse 2, this is Moriah, <coughs> seen of Yah. And who is seen of Yah in 1 Chronicles 21? Well, David saw Yah, but who really saw Yah and was seen of Yah? Well, in 1 Chronicles 21, it was Ornan. Ornan was seen of Yah. In Genesis 22, 13 and 14, Abraham sees Yah. 1 Chronicles 21, David finally in 16 and 28 sees Yah. They offer burnt offerings in Genesis 22. Verse 26 of 1 Chronicles 21, it's burnt offering. In verse 15, there's an angel from heaven. 1 Chronicles 21, verse 26, there's an answer from heaven. Verse 18, God says to Abraham, In thee and in thy seed shall all the nations be blessed. And David, in chapter 22, verse 2 of Chronicles, 
gathers the strangers from all nations. And in verse 19, Abraham and Isaac and the two young men return to Beersheba. And David <coughs> returns to the Gentiles. Why was Beersheba named Beersheba? Because of the covenant that Abraham made with Abimelech. You reckon that was a covenant about selling Coca-Cola in the desert? You reckon? You reckon that was a business covenant? No. This is the truth. And Abimelech becomes a Christadelphian. That's what that's about. And Abraham brings out seven ewe lambs. And they name the place the Well of the Seven. And that's why the seventh promise comes in Genesis 22. And that's why it's stamped all over four times by Abraham doing seven things. And that's why God sevens himself in verse 16. Now Orn is presented to us in the scripture as a king. 2 Samuel 24, 23 says this. Ornan as a king. Young literal says... The whole hath Arona, or Ornan, given as a king to a king. And he was a possible descendant of Melchizedek, was Ornan. He's a king. And he had four sons. A type of true spiritual Israel. When you look at this, isn't this fantastic? Genesis 22, you've got Abraham and Isaac. In 1 Chronicles 21, you've got the angel and Ornan in exactly the same position. Sword drawn about him. In Matthew chapter 3, Yahweh and Christ come along to fulfill the type. Brothers and sisters, there are wonderful things here, but this is how it finishes. I want you to come back, if you would, to Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen goes on to say these words. So let's just remind ourselves of what we read in verse 46. This is David who converted Gentiles instead of killing them, who found favour before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But! It's a big but! Solomon built him a house and the tabernacle of David fell over it was in ruins and Paul comes along and says Christ broke down the middle wall of petition between Jew and Gentiles that's what they had and tomorrow we'll talk about the court of the Gentiles which they corrupted by putting their tables of the money changers there and Christ cleans it out okay Solomon building a house. What does Stephen say? Verse 48. How be it the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as says the prophet. He quotes Isaiah 66 verse 1 and 2. Why does he use the title Most High, do you think? Why does he say Yahweh? Exactly right, Brother Martin. Because of Genesis 14. And the first time in your Bible you meet the title Ael Aelion is about Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. That's why Stephen uses the Most High. He's back in Genesis 14 and 15. And what did Melchizedek do? He brought out bread and wine. It's exactly what David did when he brought the ark to Zion. 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, Solomon involved the Gentiles in building the temple. He made them slaves. 70,000 of them, it says. 70,000? That was the number that God took out of Israel. David decided to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. But God didn't dwell in it. After this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David that has fallen down. And when you and I become kings and priests after the Melchizedek order, brothers and sisters, guess where we're going to serve? Guess where we will be? You've got it. Isaiah 16, verse 5. 
we will be in this building here in the tabernacle of David.